more composites, more animals. <laughs> um, so first of all, um, thanks to Cosmin and Anshi for organizing this, for making this possible. Um, so let's begin. Uh, I'll be talking about composite creatures in general, but specifically, I'm more interested in connections, different kinds of connections. I'm interested in understanding how different communities localize and translate a particular composite creature, and also interested in how an iconography um, travels and evolves across time and space, and eventually there will be localized to the point that one can no longer recognize the similarities in between these uh, different creatures. So I hope that by looking into one specific composite creature, I will be able to shed some light on this shared narrative. And I need to also clarify the title. Um, I call it speculative history because I'm approaching history from the perspective of an artist. And when I say Southeast Asia, I, really ref I, I refer to um, Malaysia, Singapore, as well as Indonesia and parts of Thailand. So in 2016, I was invited to present an artwork uh, for Singapore Biennale. I decided to present a literal interpretation of a composite animal known by the name of Makara. It is in skeletal form. Uh, and in that sense, quite literally, it explains uh, the title. It is a skeleton of Makara and it is a myth of a myth. It is an imaginary construction of a skeleton of, of a mythical animal. It is rendered in a skeletal form. For, for a few reasons. Uh, I was, in, during, especially in, re of, in recent decades, the cultural politics in Southeast Asia in the region is increasingly viewed in ethnocentric and in toxic patriotic lens. So I wanted to create an, imag an imaginary, a I wanted to discover a composite imaginary that, can, that is widespread across the region and something that is that, that that's so ordinary, but we fail to understand, we fail to see the connections in between this, these, these creatures. So I look for, identif I have identified this animal known as Makara. And of course the skeleton is also a, a, a kind of a like a commentary of, um, against the increasingly fossilizing discourse of cultures and politics in the region, which was once much more fluid. And so this, this presentation will be about this one singular composite creature called Makara. I did not include it in a title because I believe many of us, I assume many of us would not, wouldn't have heard of this creature called Makara. By the same time, I believe that as the presentation progresses, you'll be able to, you might come to, re, uh, you might realize that eventually you've actually come across one or two Makaras here and there. And as the presentation approached the end, you will also realize that there are some other Makaras that are actually much, much more popular than we ought to think. But they are no longer called Makara. They are, they're, they're called, in a, they are called other names and they come in other forms. So let us begin by, I'll just scroll through some images of Makara and I think this gives you very little detail about what a Makara should look like. Just to give you a sense of how Makara looks like. Here you have a Makara palanquin ornament it is usually seen with, uh, it's basically a composite of an elephant trunk with a pair of horns and the jaws look like uh, a crocodile. Also from the same area in the northern part of Malay Peninsula, you can also see this is a modern rendition of Makara decorating the boat prow and it's, a, it's painted on the boat prow. Here again, you can find the elephant trunk with a pair of tusks, jaws, while the entire body was kind of, co kind of covered with um, fish or dragon scale. And it also decorates a uh, Malay Karis hilt. Karis is a Malay traditional sword. In this sense, uh, Makara also resembles a kind of power, right? And if you notice that uh, from the first image to this image, Makara is almost always a crowned figure. It is always wearing a crown, which is indicative of a certain um, power as well as status. Beyond the Malay region, you can find different kinds of Makara. It's in, this is in Java. It's a very small, intricate carving. And if you look at this from, from the bottom, you can find that on the second image, there's a bird emerging out of its mouth. This will be a very, norm uh, a very common visual language throughout um, in subsequent uh, representation that Makara is always spewing out different life forms. So Makara has predominantly traveled from South Asia uh, across the Indian Ocean and into Java Sea. But primarily in the earlier centuries of um, civilizations, you can find 
Makara more prominently in northern and as well as central India, such as in religious sites such as Bodh Gaya, Sanchi, as well as uh, capital cities of early empires such as Pataliputra. The earlier manifestations of Makara actually resembles more like an actually existing um, animal, and in this case, it looks like a crocodile. If you if you're able to read some of the uh, uh, Sanskritic Pali or Prakrit dictionaries, they tend to translate Makara as sea monsters sea animals, even sharks, dolphins, and essentially crocodile. The word magar, which, uh, which then develops into makara, the word maga quite literally denotes crocodile. And there is also a related Sanskrit word known as sisumara. It means crocodile, but literally it means, it refers to baby killers. So perhaps in this form, makara actually resembles a sign of unknown danger that is lurking in deep waters. There are also different variations of makara. As you can see from these two images, you can begin to see artists are experimenting with the composite form. So you have a, more, a more elephantine head, and on the second image is a crocodilian head. Also notice that on the crocodile head, which uh, the, the, the upper snout of this crocodile uh, ends with a curl. So the upper snout is always curling upwards as well as inwards. This will be another common trick that we should notice when, whenever we, we identified a makara. And there is another common point between these two images is that they are holding a garland. And as we know, a garland is a sign of abundance. Later on in the 5th and 6th centuries, we begin to see Makara becoming a beast of burden. And as riding animals, Makara is often seen um, on these ancient monuments as fetching Hindu, Hindu deities, divine figures such as Kamadeva or Varuna, as well as uh, Ganga, which is the god of the river Ganges. So as Makara turns into a beast of burden, um, Makara becomes a, a vehicle, a wahana. And because Makara is a composite animal, it is a combination of terrestrial as well as aquatic animals, Makara is able to fetch these divine figures across different territories, whether it's land, water, as well as cutting across, trespassing different cosmic territories. So speaking of roaming different territories, um, there is another important symbolism of Makara. Uh, this is not from India, but I'm just showing you this as a visual example uh, of Vedic or Hindu astrology. Stuck in between the Sagittarius as well as the Aquarius is Capricorn. And if you can read the text, the English writes Capricorn, and above the English text reads Makara in Tamil. So Makara and Capricorn, they are actually symbolically equivalent. So in this sense, if you have come across a Capricorn, you've actually come across a keen to Makara. Um, and in this form, Makara is seen decorating, uh, it has an elephant trunk, it, is, it has the crocodilian jaws, as well as uh, a pair of wings, and it ends with a peacock tail. Now, I wanted to dwell a little bit deeper into this uh, idea of Capricorn. In ancient Rome, the Roman imperial coins of Augustus, is, um, Capricorn is a very popular image. And Capricorn is seen in these two images holding a rudder, steering a globe which is symbolic of dominance over the, the entire world. And behind Capricorn, you can find what was known as the cornucopia, the horn of plenty, and which is, again, equivalent to the Hindu variant of Makara that is holding a garland, which indicates abundance, infinite supply of flowers, of fruits, of, of all kinds of um, um, supplies for the ancient empire. So in this regard, whether it's Makara or Capricorn, it really means, um, it really represents a kind of power that trespass d different realms, whether it's land, water, and for Augustus, of course, it is, it is control or dominance over land and water. So when Makara enters into East Asia, it is transliterated as Mo Jie or Mo Jie Luo. And there are other affiliated creatures such as Tsu Wen or Tsu Wei or Yu Long, which basically means uh, fish dragon. So you can see that in Hinduism, Makara is a composite of crocodile, elephant, of both aquatic and terrestrial animals. In East Asia, things uh, turn out a little bit different. And the fish is added into this composite because if you, if you know Chinese, the, 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 the word fish is also a homonym to the word uh, excess yu. So again, the idea of abundance spreads around uh, these, this iconography. This is one of the examples of uh, Makara. It's not called Makara in this case, but uh, there are semblances to it. In, this is a classical painting in the 18th century, but 
it is a copy of an earlier painting. You can see that there's a fish, uh, what appears to be a mythical, mythical animal. It looks like a fish with the head of a dragon. And most of the time, they are decorating the roof ridges. Here you have a front, you have two front paws with the tail curving upwards, represent, uh, kind of mirroring the Hindu variant of Makara, but with a trunk. In this case, it, it serves a talismanic purpose to prevent temple fire. In the later centuries, um, the Tsuwan evolves into a fish and a dragon without the front paws. And later, artists also experimented with reforms and added cloud ornaments onto its body. In this case, uh, while the fish is always known as an aquatic animal, um, to have having clouds ornamenting the body also indicates that it can perhaps travel across the sky. When it reaches Japan, it's called Sachihoko. The fins of the fish ex becomes more, much more exaggerated and sometimes it turns into a pair of wings. And here's just an example of the degree of cross-pollination of these images. Um, you can see in the first image is basically a fish dragon, but in the second you find in Tibet, the makara decorating the, the ewer's spout. And on the third image is a Tibetan inspired Chinese ewers. Uh, again, there's a makara decorating the spout, but it's not carved as in uh, like the second image, it's painted on porcelain. It, around the 10th century in Liao Dynasty, makara, the, the motif makara becomes more miniaturized. So it, uh, people wear people wear these images on, on the body, where it's, uh, in this case, the first image is described as exactly as Mootie, which is Makara. And the second image is basically Makara year ornaments. Uh, if you look at the, the first image, notice that the upper snout of the creature, again, it is curling upwards and inwards. So this is something that, again, um, beginning from the Hindu variant of Makara, the, the first few examples I've shown you, until this, current example, you can begin to see that um, one of the distinctive forms of Makara is actually the, cur the curves. And it should not surprise us that the Makara earrings, um, take the, that the Makara motif takes this form of ear ornament because if you know about the dance of Shiva statue, uh, this motif, uh, Shiva is always seen as this figure that um, as he dances, he gives birth to production and destruction of the world. And on his right ears, there's always a makara ornament, year, year ornament known as makara kundala. So from makara to Mortier in East Asia, and finally in Southeast Asia, where you can find different varieties of makara. Here are just some examples in, again, in the 8th and 9th century, there are kala makara ornaments. Um, in this case, you can see that there's, there's a kala at the top, located at the top of this gateway. Kala is basically the god of time, right? And it is a symbol of destruction. In in China's ancient ancient China's symbolism, it is usually known as sometimes known as Tao Tie. So it's a symbol of greed. And Kala is always uh, decorating the upper part of the the gateway and without the lower jaws because he is it is too too greedy to the point that it consumes its own body and its lower jaws. So um, you can see on the gateway. By the side of it, there are a pair, there's a pair of makara. <laughs> so it doesn't only decorate ancient monuments, but also in forms like this gunungan in Shadow Puppet Theater, that you can again see that the makara stretch to the edges and curls upwards. So in this regard, whether it's this representation or the, the first, the, the, the ancient monuments, kala makara motif basically uh, signify a kind of life cycle so kala represents destructive force, while makara, per perhaps the, the productive force within this cycle of life. And it's also important to note that this gunungan is, a, is quite a very important um, image because in, in shadow puppet theater, if you open up a scene or if you, if, you, if, you fin if you end the scene or between scenes, transitions, this image uh, signals the, the beginning, the end, as well as the transitions between the scenes. And therefore, it is a symbol of re rejuvenation, a symbol of beginning, a symbol of life, and destruction of life. So diasporic communities when, um, from India, from India as well as South, Southern China, when they arrive in Southeast Asia around 18th, 19th centuries, 
then they carry along with them a different variant of Makara. These are Hindu temples in Singapore. You can see Makara decorating the arches. And in this case, they resemble um, the, the Southern India Makara, or sometimes it looks more like a Sri Lankan Makara. And also in Chinese temples in the region. So it's interesting to note that um, all these makaras or forms of makara ornaments, um, they can be found throughout the region and they manifest themselves in different forms. But hardly do we speak of these different variations of a similar narrative um, together. We often seen them and we often talked about them in ways that would, not, would conceal the shared narrative that underpins these creatures. So when I'm looking into Makara as a connecting point between these different cultures, religion, even politics, I'm interested in Makara not only as a composite of multiple narrative, I'm also interested in Makara as a composite of multiple life forms. What do I mean by that? Perhaps I've already indicated earlier that Makara was spewing out multiple life forms. So if you look at, again, these images, on the first image, you can see that there is this dancing figure kind of emerging out of its mouth and the upper snout of Makara transform into what appears to be perhaps a seated lion. On the second image, it is an architectural fitting in Thai temples. So at the bottom, you can see there's a Makara with its jaw opening wide, regurgitating a Naga or a Naga Makara, sometimes conflated, emerging, which is the, the dragon eventually spewing out another serpent. So it's a, there's a chain of life. And if you travel to Thailand, you'll be able to see this in almost every Thai Buddhist temple. It's basically a Makara spewing out mul uh, a multi-headed serpent. There is an interesting account by a Thai Buddhist monk who claims that, he's probably, it's a per his personal interpretation, who claims that this motif, this Naga Makara balustrade decorative uh, tells us, reminds us humans to be humble because a creature as powerful as this multi-headed serpent can risk being swallowed by a makara. And this perhaps is also a sign that makara is not always a productive force. It can be a destructive force. And this image of the, the chain of life or the destruction and production of life uh, is not limited to Southeast Asia. In other parts of South Asia, you can also find similar images of makara regurgitating multiple life forms. And on the second image is interesting in Nepal, you can always find this image of a makara spewing out what appears to be maybe a crocodile or a fish spewing out another fish and the trunk of the makara morphs into a bird. This is another example from um, Thailand. Uh, this is a modern rendition. Uh, it is a makara spewing out another makara spewing out a mythical animal, a, a lizard of sorts. It's called Mon. Uh, and what is interesting is that there are some text and some captions that's located on Bellu Streets. It says that time devours every creature along with itself or including itself. So again, Makara is not just a productive force. It is embedded in this cycle of life as a productive as well as a destructive force. So here we arrive at a point where the Makara emerges as, as something that is ambivalent. It is not always um, producing multiple life forms. It, can, it is perhaps consuming multiple life forms. In a brilliant study by Frederick Bosch, um, the book entitled The Golden Germ, he has this brilliant illustrations of Makaras gathered from different sites. And on the second image in particular, you can notice that artists are experimenting with the form, with the composite imaginary, with the composite um, makara. And as they do so, they also try to decorate it with these swirls and this foliation. At a later part of um, the architecture, especially in ancient monuments in Java, you can begin to see that these makara takes up, assume a form that's more decorative. So you can see that if you are not familiar with the makara image, very likely this will be just a collection of volutes, you will not be able to identify that there's actually an elephant trunk and there are jaws emerging out of its mouth. More images uh, from Sumatra as well as Java. Here again, um, the makara is almost hidden in these floral motifs, in these curls. So to the untrained eyes, these are just floral motifs, but actually they are a residual image of the makara. 
And eventually in northern part of the Malay Peninsula, uh, especially after the arrival of Islam, there is another kind of narrative that emerged out of this uh, composite form. As I've shown you earlier that there's this image of a tree-like uh, gunungan on the second image. Uh, on the first image, you, you, you can see that the curls does not, re does not resemble any kinds of animal. This is because the is Islam, in Islam, uh, they prohibit the figurative representation. So most of these animal forms have been abstracted or stylized into floral motifs. And of course, we shouldn't think of this as a linear progression because both of this, uh, this, this, these puppets coexist with one another. They are just variations of this form. In the kitchen door, again, uh, on the transom, on the semicircular transom, you can find on the edges, on the fringe of the door, that there is a curl that is rendered in floral motifs. In this case, in, especially in the Malay cultural region, it's called Sulur Bayung. And in Javanese, sometimes it's known as Pilin Tegar. Pilin Tegar or Sulur Bayung means um, something like a, a recalcitrant spirals, basically sp floral spirals that would spread disorderly. Right? And this again reminds us of Makara's production of life that is disorder, that is chaotic. And here finally, you, we, we find an image that looks exactly like Kala Makara motif, but in a floral foliated form. The Kala is located at the center and out comes the, the foliation that curls inward, just like the elephant trunk. So as we have seen from these images that after Islamization or after um, the stylization of the Makara as a form, we begin to see Makara in different kind of manifestation that does not really resemble a Makara to be exact. But there are other examples. Now I wanted to show you two examples, two specific case studies in Southeast Asia. The first is in Chiribon, the second in a place that is perhaps more familiar to many of us in Singapore. And these, in these two, two case studies, um, they are not exactly, these composite figures are not exactly called Makara, but there are certain connections between these composites in these two distinct areas uh, with Makara. Perhaps Makara, when it travels across the region and is localized and being retranslated into different forms, it becomes a template for other composite imaginings. Cherubon is located in West Java. So this is a zoomorphic carriage. It is known by the name Paxi Nagaliman. Paxi, it is a very straightforward name. So Paxi, you can translate it as bird, naga is dragon or serpent, liman is elephant. So it's bird, dragon, elephant, carriage. So in Chiribon to the local communities, Paxi Nagaliman is a composite of three animals. And in this regard, it has multiple, it serves multiple symbolism. So if you, if you ask uh, local communities there, especially at this moment, uh, because of tourism industry, they will tend to tell you that this is an image that represents the multicultural society in Chiribon. Because Paxi represents um, the wings of the Burak, which is similar to what Simon was talking about yesterday, uh, the wings of the Burak, which is Islam, while Naga is the representation of Chinese, and Liman, which is the elephant, the Ganesha, is representative of India or Hinduism. So, it's the, so they kind of situate Chiribon amidst this civil... Civili different civilizational discourse or history, basically saying that Chiribon is part of world history. But in some other publications, you can also find, especially er the, the earlier publications before this creature is being reinterpreted in this way, um, they also refer to Paxi as, uh, as, as Paxi Nagaliman as representation of different projects of the, uh, the military. So basically Paxi flies, so Paxi is the Air Force, Naga is the Navy, Liman is the Army. Now, of course, um, this carriage, the carriage that I shown you earlier was no longer in use because it, it's an old um, carriage believed to be built in the 15th century, according to local his, uh, oral tradition. But they, they eventually constructed a replica and they performed pilgrimage during the night of Suro or Muharram. They would travel about seven kilometers and to visit uh, the, the tomb sites, the sacred complex of Sunan Gunung Jati, one of the nine saints that have that was believed to have islamized the whole of java contemporary artist fx arsono created 
a reproduction of the Paksinaga Liman carriage in part of his uh, this mixed media installation called Purification. So he is commenting on um, a very particular movement that there is this uh, Islamic Orthodox movement, especially in Jakarta, based in mostly uh, urban centers, trying to purify um, the Islamic practice in Indonesia. They they think that Islamic Islam in Indonesia is contaminated by local traditions. Uh, and this is particularly advocated by the party called uh, named Muhammadiyah. So, when FX Harsono was rep was was presenting this image in this in installation, he wanted to reveal a certain kind of um, discourse uh, from Chiribon that is tolerant to other religions, that is multicultural. But if we look back into history of this creature. Uh, we can begin to notice that the idea that this creature represents multiculturalism or multi-religious or so on and so forth is actually a, a, a quite a modern anachronistic interpretation of this creature. Again, uh, the, I'm showing you the, the motive of cosmic tree, but this gunungan is of a Chiribonis edition. The three main animals in this cosmic tree is not makara, but the three, an uh, three animals, the elephant, the dragon, as well as the bird. So in this case, the bird represents the upper realm, the snake, the dragon, represents the netherworld, and the elephant, the earth. The elephant is often seen as having four arms, and two of the arms were holding the entire earth. In, in Cherbon, Ganesha, is the, the elephant is also known as Ganesha or Sangha Buana, so the, the bearer of the world. So Paksi Nagaliman, in this regard, the composite of these three animals is basically a representation, a symbolic representation of the entire universe. The entire universe um, that is composed out of these three animals or represented by these three animals is actually a macrocosm to a microcosmic um, body. Because in, in Chirbonis Islam, which is highly influenced by Sufism, especially by Tarikat Naksbandi or Shatariya, they see the body as constituted by three parts. So first the head, the heart, the cult, and the loin. And if you notice the first image, there is an inscription of La, Lam Alif, uh, which is the first letter of the Kalima Shahada, the Islamic creed, um, that is being written on the head, on the heart, as well as the loin. It is also interesting to know that uh, in some of the Chirabonis uh, Islam manuscript, you will be able to see that they describe these three realms as Trimurti, or three buana, which is three realms, or perhaps also three pun, something that uh, Lawrence was mentioning earlier. Uh, the, 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 the unity of this three, three world, which is a cosmological idea that is very prominent throughout Southeast Asia. And also, on top of this idea of the Trinity, they also talked about the, the head being a representation of Baitul Makmur, and the heart as a representation of Baitul Muharram, and the loin as Baitul Mukaddas. So these are Islamic or Arabic terms that represents the different um, sacred sites in the Islamic world. And if we look into another study by Adrian Snodgrass, who did a study, a brilliant study on, on stupa, uh, there is an interesting illustration of a yogin. And in this, in this illustration, he compares the channeling of flows, of respiratory flows, uh, to the motive of a kala makara ornament. So as I've enlarged, there's a makara and there's kala on top. So the channeling of flows represents um, the, the life cycle, the, the, the productive and dis or destructive life cycle in a yogin, the, the, a practitioner of yoga. Now in both of these images, you'll be able to see that uh, whether it's Paksin Agaliman or Kala Makara motive, the kind of images or symbols that they signify have share quite a lot of different similarities. But the Paksin Aga Liman image is not limited again to Chiribon. In other parts of Southeast Asia, whether it's Madura or Myanmar, or in even further parts to Rakhine, to Rakhine State, you will be able to find other kinds of Makara-like animals, but they are not called Makara, neither are they called Paksin Aga Liman. The first image is basically understood as a flying horse or the steed of Muhammad, the Prophet Muhammad, which is basically the Burak. In, in Indonesian language, it's known as Kuda Sambrani. So it's basically a horse with a wing. It's not considered as a composite animal. On the second image, um, you can see this animal 
It is known as Pinsya Rupa or Pancha Rupa. So it's called Pinsya Rupa literally denotes five form. So instead of a composite of three animals, in Myanmar, it is understood as a composite of five animals. And even in Rakhine state, there is another animal known as Birala or Nawa Rupa. Nawa Rupa is not five, not three, it is nine forms. Right. So in different region, you'll be able to see how local communities, uh, as they appropriate this composite animal, they add onto it different kinds of narratives and sometimes even increase the number of its constituents, perhaps to tell different stories of um, or, or values about history. Most of the time, if you ask um, the, the, the communities, what do they think about uh, Pinsia Rupa or Nava Rupa, they will be able to enumerate uh, what do each animal parts represent. Most of the time, it represents like uh, a certain wisdom, uh, moral values. And sometimes they are quite competitive about it. So you have someone saying that our oh, Pinsia Rupa is five, but we have Nava Rupa, which is constituted by nine. So it is more powerful than the five form. So the final example is from Singapore. And in Singapore, there's no other composite that is as famous as the Merlion. The Merlion logo is created in the 1960s. So it's a very very recent invention. It is purely a graphic, it's a graphic design product uh, that is created for tourism to also to instill a sense of belonging to fellow Singaporeans. In the 1970s, the Merlion statue was erected and it was conceptualized by someone known by name Kwan Sai Kyung. And eventually in 2002, uh, the Merlion statue was relocated to its present location in, in this place, and it's the, the, the image that you have to take a selfie with whenever you go to Singapore. So the Merlion is also a composite image, and quite similar to Makara, perhaps, uh, Merlion is a composite of terrestrial and aquatic animals. It is a combination of lion and fish. You might be wondering why these two animals now, most of the time in commercial blurbs, you will be able to see, um, and here I paraphrase that, uh, the fish is represent, represents the fishing village of, of Singapore's past, while the lion head represents the roaring lion that is heading towards the future. Now, of course, um, this is a commercial blurb. It's a modern interpretation. But actually, if you look into some of the manuscripts, you will be able to find um, that uh, in one of the manuscripts called Sejarah uh, Melayu, or the Malay Annals, the lion is, there was a sighting, there's an event that where the kings sighted a lion and def, therefore called the place the Lion City. So Singhapura, so it's the port city of lion. And if we follow the idea of the, the commercial blurb that I mentioned earlier, the lion and the fish as representative of a history, a past and a future, the past of the fishing village that becomes a roaring lion. Perhaps we can, we can also see Merlion as a composite of multiple teri uh, temporalities, of multiple timings, not just of multiple animals. In 1999, a curious article titled Merlion and Makara Symbolize Protection emerged in the Straits Time. And here I quote the line, the Merlion is a clever adaptation of the Malacca. Malacca is a place in Malaysia. Malacca, Makara, both mythical beasts depict a search for a social philosophy and symbolize protection. Subsequently, also in the same year, somebody did a, uh, wrote a response towards the articles talking about how Merlion legend came about omitted by uh, Wilfred, his uh, fictional author. And in this article, he claims that if my memory does not fail me, it was a Mr. Quo who originally from Malacca conceptualized the myth of the Merlion. Now, who is Mr. Kuo? In the history of Merlion, we are, we are unable to tell. We can't speculate, but the closest name, perhaps that comes closest to uh, Mr. Kuo is perhaps Kwan Sai Kyung, the person who conceptualized not the, the Merlion logo, but the Merlion statue. And when he passed away in 1981, there was an article, a tribute article about him. The man behind the Merlion was the late Mr. Kwan Sai Kyung. This was not widely known before, but yesterday, his family disclosed the information. His daughter, Margaret Kwan, said that one of my father's pieces of art was used as the design for the Merlion. And he adds, there has been no publicity about this because my father didn't want it. It is also important to note that Kwan Sai Kyung was born in Malacca. In Malacca, there's really only one Makara statue, which looks like this. It is located in, um, it was once located in uh, 
facing the riverbanks of Makara, oh, the, <laughs> the riverbanks of Malacca, and now it's been relocated to the museum in Malacca. Now, archaeologists and historians have talked about it, claiming that this Makara, despite being placed in Malacca, is most likely a production. Uh, uh, it's, it's most likely an object that is produced in present-day Indonesia, and judging from the stylistics, most likely from Sumatra. So here we find what appears to be a very interesting historical trajectories. The inspiration that perhaps inspired the Merlion was actually inspired by a Makara that's located in present-day Malaysia, who is, and the Makara was actually produced in Sumatra, in, in, in present-day Indonesia. This is interesting because it looked into how the composite imagination trespassed nation-states' boundaries. And as a template, perhaps, Makara in, has inspired the, the design of Merlion to the point that we no longer recognize it. There are, other some, there are, there are, there are more similarities between Merlion and Makara. If you notice that uh, when the government erected the Merlion statue, uh, because they are afraid that the local citizens of Singapore will not be able to take pictures with the full, the full frontal image with, the, with Merlion, so they created an, a miniature version of Merlion so that people can take a selfie with its front. This is because of Feng Shui. So Merlion has to face, has to confront the river. This is quite similar to Makara that has to always confront the sea because of its aff affiliation with ideas of water with production. Fast forward to 1998, there is a pair of Merlion statues in Ang Mokyo uh, that is seen uh, guarding the junction towards a residential area. In this regard, it is not too far-fetched to think of its similarity with the pair of Makara balustrades ornamenting this ancient Javanese monuments in the 8th or 9th century. So Makara has traveled to East Asia, to Southeast Asia, and it has been localized, translated into multiple other kinds of animals. It is known by other names, which I might not have the time to explain everything. Right. But it's interesting to know that Makara th is not limited. The, the, the composite imagery of Makara is never limited to Makara in and of itself. So as we juxtapose these different images, it is important to note the common narrative that, is, that proceeds across this different distinct uh, composite imaginary. But very, very little has been talked about it. And usually when historians try to understand these images, they talk about the historical specificities, specificities of these images rather than revealing that, his, that shared narrative that cuts across region. So by presenting this artwork, I was trying to show this shared narrative is perhaps um, fossilized um, and rendered oblivious by new boundary mechanisms and it's often fueled by very toxic ideas of ethnocentric nationalism and patriotism. And I hope to see that uh, by, 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 by presenting this research background of this artwork, I hope to show you that Makara can be a starting point, a point of departure for interreferencing and to reawaken a kind of trace of historical consciousness or to also think about the history of imagination that can never be historicized or can never be truly recorded. So to, in order to understand that the region is way more connected than what we have ever imagined. Thank you.